The North American gypsy moth has ravaged forest and urban areas of the northeastern United States, defoliating millions of acres since its introduction over a century ago. Research and regulatory efforts have been able to delimit, isolate, and control this destructive pest. However, today there's a new pest, potentially more dangerous to the environment and the economy than the North American gypsy moth. It's been detected and is attempting to establish itself in the Pacific Northwest and in British Columbia. It's called the Asian gypsy moth and it's coming to dinner. Unless it's eradicated or controlled, the eating habits of this uninvited visitor are a substantial threat to the forests of North America. Dr. Bill Walner is Senior Research Forest Entomologist at the U.S. Forest Service's Northeastern Forest Experiment Station. He's been studying this new pest with research associates at the Center for Biological Control of Northeast Forest Insects and Diseases in Hamden, Connecticut. Bill has traveled to the former Soviet Union in China several times to research this dangerous pest in the field with scientists from its host countries. Now Bill would like to share his knowledge with you. During the next few minutes, I'd like to compare and contrast the gypsy moth from Europe, now called the North American gypsy moth, with its Asian cousin, a recent immigrant from the Russian Far East. Hopefully, this will provide you with a better understanding of this economically important new pest and why there was concern that it might become a permanent resident of North America. The Asian gypsy moth and the North American gypsy moth have the same basic life cycle. Most larvae hatch in the spring from eggs laid the previous summer. There is premature hatch in North American gypsy moth of 2 to 3 percent the same year eggs are laid. In the Asian gypsy moth, premature hatch may be as high as 25 percent. The newly hatched larvae climb to the tops of trees or other objects, suspend themselves downward with silken threads, are caught by the wind, and are blown randomly over variable distances. The majority of larvae are blown only several hundred meters before settling on suitable hosts and initiating feeding. During the next seven to eight weeks, larvae feed on the foliage of a variety of plants, pass through five instars for males and six instars for females, then pupate. Adults emerge from pupae in about two weeks. Males emerge two to three days before females. Males locate females by a pheromone she releases. Mating occurs and eggs are laid in masses of up to 1,000 eggs. The North American female is flightless and egg masses usually are found in the same location in which she pupated. The female of the Asian gypsy moth is a strong flyer and after mating may lay her egg mass some distance from where she fed as a larva. Thus, there are several behavioral and physiological differences which make the Asian gypsy moth potentially more threatening to our forests and urban areas than the North American gypsy moth. The gypsy moth is believed to have originated in Asia many thousands of years ago. Several races of gypsy moth have evolved. One of these races spread to Europe and many of its original traits diminished as it spread across Asia into Europe. The gypsy moth we refer to today as the North American gypsy moth was imported from France to Massachusetts by Leopold Truvelo, who wanted to cross it with the silkworm in order to develop a silk maker that could be raised on oak trees. Since its accidental release in 1869, it has spread from Massachusetts west into Ohio and Michigan and south into Virginia and West Virginia. This rate of spread has been about 12 miles per year and is based upon the dispersal of first instar larvae. While males are active flyers, the females of this race are flightless. Therefore, first instar larval dispersal is the sole means of natural spread of the North American gypsy moth. Asian gypsy moth egg masses were first detected in North America in Vancouver, British Columbia Harbor by Agriculture Canada inspectors in 1981 on ships that had steamed from Siberian ports. The incidence of egg masses detected on ships increased dramatically between 1989 and 1991, presumably correlating with the outbreak of the pest in the Russian Far East. Ships in that region, bound for North America, became infested with Asian gypsy moth egg masses while loading and unloading cargo. 
In addition to Vancouver, these ships have visited several ports in the northwestern United States. And the USDA's Animal Plant Health Inspection Service has detected infested Russian vessels entering Pacific Northwest ports. In the spring of 1991, larvae were found hatching from egg masses on a ship in Vancouver Harbor by Agriculture Canada's Owen Croy. It was feared that infestations may have become established in both the United States and Canada as a result of larvae hatching from eggs on ships and being blown on shore. How we discovered that the Asian race of gypsy moth was present on North American soil is a story involving both sex and molecular biology. First, the sex. The method used to detect the presence of gypsy moth in new areas is traps baited with a sex pheromone. These traps contain a synthetic version of the odor put out by females when they want to attract males for mating. I have tested in both China and in Russia the pheromone used to trap the gypsy moth in North America. This pheromone also was attractive to the male gypsy moth in these countries. Thus, if Asian larvae were blown ashore and did find suitable host plants and matured to adults, the traps deployed in the Northwest for North American gypsy moth may have caught the Asian gypsy moth. Now the molecular biotechnology. Male Asian and North American gypsy moths are very similar in appearance. Also, the condition of moths caught in sticky traps makes identification based on morphological features difficult. So a technique, colloquially referred to as genetic fingerprinting, was used to obtain definitive identifications. Richard Harrison at Cornell University used mitochondrial DNA sequencing to analyze for differences in genetic patterns. He found that there were at least five positions in the gene sequence which consistently differed between the Asian gypsy moth and the North American gypsy moth. Here you see an analysis of three gypsy moth males showing their amino acid patterns. The two on the left are Asian and the one on the right is North American gypsy moth. The arrows indicate where the patterns differ. Based on this procedure, Asian gypsy moths were identified from Vancouver, British Columbia, Tacoma, Washington, and Portland, Oregon. Since the mitochondrial DNA sequencing procedure requires special equipment and time to sequence adult patterns, efforts are underway to refine this technique for more rapid identification. Furthermore, mitochondrial DNA is maternally linked, and if mating occurs between the North American and Asian races, this technique may not always be reliable. For instance, if a North American gypsy moth female mates with an Asian gypsy moth male, their progeny would be identified as North American gypsy moth, despite the fact that they might have Asian characteristics. Development of another technique, nuclear gene markers, will solve this problem. More traditional morphological methods can also be used to identify gypsy moth population. Phil Kingsley of the USDA's Animal Plant Health Inspection Service and Joseph Kunkel of the University of Massachusetts are testing wing morphometric pattern analysis as a method for discriminating between the Asian gypsy moth and the North American gypsy moth. Using the same male moths caught in traps, the body for mitochondrial DNA sequencing and the wing for morphometrics Wing analysis properly identified the moth. This procedure could provide a rapid means to make a preliminary identification of the Asian gypsy moth from large samples of moths. The North American gypsy moth exhibits remarkably little differences in larval color, whereas the Asian gypsy moth, reflecting its greater genetic diversity, displays a wide range of color morphs. This variation in color and the proportion within a local population are reported to indicate the population dynamics phase. That is, whether the population is in latency, outbreak, or collapse phase. I have analyzed populations across the Commonwealth of Independent States and from North America using head capsule color imaging. As you can see, it is possible to identify with a high degree of certainty geographic races such as those from North America on the left and that on the right of a larva reared from egg masses from Russian vessels. Populations across the Commonwealth of Independent States show unique spectral patterns, including those from Nahotka, where ships were infested. 
Since both the Asian gypsy moth and the North American gypsy moth utilize burlap bands placed around the trunks of trees to rest during the day, this method of capture can be used to estimate larval densities following control activities and to delimit populations. It can also be useful for identifying the North American gypsy moth, the Asian gypsy moth, and possibly their hybrids through head capsule color imaging. What was the Asian gypsy moth doing on grain ships? After all, the gypsy moth is a forest pest. It feeds on trees. Why then would this pest lay eggs on the ships? Unlike the North American race, female Asian gypsy moths are strong flyers and are capable of ascending, directed, long distance flight up to or greater than 30 kilometers. While it is not known what conditions initiate flight, or for that matter, if all females fly, my observations in China and the Russian Far East suggest two types of flight behavior. Diurnal overpositional flight precedes egg laying. Such flights are usually short distances, several hundred meters, and are within individual forest stands. Their purpose is to deposit egg masses on the trunks of trees such as birch, poplar, or pine, or on the leaves of broadleaf trees. Nocturnal female flight is usually three to five kilometers, but flight up to 30 kilometers or more is possible. Directed flight to rock bluffs has the purpose of positioning eggs in crevices for protection from low winter temperatures. This sequence is evident in central Siberia where eggs were deposited after females flew from a river bottom where they fed as larvae some 12 to 15 kilometers away. The availability of host plants undoubtedly plays a role in female flight distance. In the region of Lake Baikal, larch is periodically defoliated by the gypsy moth, even though trees are widely scattered in this forest steppe zone. Thus, female flight positions egg masses on widely scattered hosts. The patterns of female flight or loss of flight across the former Soviet Union demonstrate the variability in behavior of this insect. Flight capacity diminishes at the base of the Ural Mountains in the Republic of Bashkiria and is completely lost in Western Europe. Artificial light attracts females and can result in massive deposition of egg masses on buildings, lampposts, or other objects associated with lighting devices. This attraction to light has resulted in egg mass deposition on the superstructures of ships in the ports of Nahutka and Vostochny at night when cargo transfer is occurring. These isolated Russian ports are surrounded by forests infested with the Asian gypsy moth, creating an ideal situation for infestation of ships and cargo by egg-laying females attracted to lights. I will be testing lights of different spectral patterns in Russia with scientists there to determine if replacement of lighting in ports and on ships with non-attractive spectral patterns is a feasible way of reducing infestations on ships and their cargoes. Female flight complicates our traditional ways of dealing with isolated infestations of the gypsy moth. The usual procedure is to use pheromone traps for detection in year one, to increase traps for delimitation in year two, and control in year three. This procedure is based on the North American gypsy moth's limited ability to disperse because the female is flightless and dispersal by first instar larvae is limited to a few hundred meters. My experience in the Russian Far East where I trap females at black lights indicates females mate and then disperse. Thus our methodology of detection, delimitation, based on captures of males may be of marginal value when it comes to the Asian gypsy moth. It may only provide evidence of where the female has been and not necessarily where subsequent egg masses and the next year's population will occur. The major concern relative to the Asian gypsy moth becoming established in northwestern North America is its impact upon forests, urban tree plantings, and environmentally sensitive plant zones. Studies by Jeff Miller of Oregon State University have shown that the Northwest has an array of trees and shrubs suitable to the North American gypsy moth. These include oak, red alder, and Douglas fir. 
The Asian gypsy moth may feed on no more species than the North American gypsy moth, but may be more voracious and perform better on marginal hosts. In laboratory feeding trials, Mike Montgomery of the U.S. Forest Service and Paul Schaefer of the Agricultural Research Service compared rates of growth of the North American, Asian, and European races of the gypsy moth. The Asian gypsy moth gained more weight than the other races on oak, larch, and birch. In Asia, larch is a principal food plant of the gypsy moth, and defoliation of it is a major problem. We anticipate that the Asian gypsy moth will be far more destructive since its host range is broader than that of the North American gypsy moth. In Russia, the Asian gypsy moth's host range is reported to include 600 species of plants. This does not bode well for the forests of the Pacific Northwest. Even though the Asian gypsy moth has a complement of natural enemies in Asia, such as the nucleopolydrosis virus, which infects these larvae near Habadovsk, Control in Russia and other republics is sometimes necessary. In Russia, as in North America, the emphasis is on biological rather than synthetic pesticides. Aerial applications are made of Bacillus thuringiensis, Bt, Virin Ench, their nucleopolydrosis virus product, and an insect growth regulator. As in the United States, control in Russia is invoked to protect foliage in recreational areas such as the Black Sea, and to prevent mortality to timber, as you see here in Bashkiria. However, the frequency of control efforts may need to be increased in North America, since we know that newly introduced pests are often more serious problems than they were in the country of origin. New environments often lack the full complement of natural enemies present where the pest evolved. An analysis of the major forest types in the Southwest and the Pacific Northwest which would be susceptible to the Asian gypsy moth, gives one reason to be very concerned. It is unlikely that pines and spruces will be seriously impacted, since we anticipate, as in the Northeast, these species will be fed upon only after preferred host foliage is exhausted. However, in the Northeast, outbreaks have resulted in the mortality of hemlock and understory white pine. In the Northwest, Douglas fir commonly grows in admixture with larch, hemlock, poplar, and alder. It could be impacted significantly when populations that build up and defoliate broadleaf trees and larch disperse to and defoliate Douglas fir. Conducting research on the Asian gypsy moth will not be easy. It is an exotic pest, and research on it can only be done in its native land, Asia, or inside approved quarantine facilities. Despite this impediment, we hope to be able to increase our understanding of this race to a level similar to that of the North American race. What might the future spread of the Asian gypsy moth be if the area of susceptible host types and larval and female dispersal potential are factored into our analysis? Using a simple diffusion model, Sandy Liebold of the U.S. Forest Service combined these factors to produce a prediction of the rate of spread for the Asian gypsy moth. This model indicates a rate of spread three times greater than that which has occurred for the North American gypsy moth in the eastern United States. The problem in predicting what the impact of the Asian gypsy moth might be is that we don't have enough information. At this point, all we can do is infer from our knowledge of the North American gypsy moth and apply what is generally known about the Asian gypsy moth. We must gain the necessary knowledge and take action so that additional introductions do not occur from the Russian Far East or other Asian countries. Pest problems like the Asian gypsy moth are likely to increase as trade between Russia and North America increases. Research efforts on the forest pests in the United States, Canada, Russia, and Asia will need to be accelerated if we wish to keep abreast of pests like the Asian gypsy moth.